Welcome back to the show, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, heroes and villains. I'm your host, Deshaun Fauntleroy. This is a very special episode. We have Thomas Stallworth II coming on. He's an assistant strength coach for the New York Giants. Now, when Thomas comes on, he's going to be explaining to the young athlete who has NFL aspirations how to approach the strength and conditioning process. He'll later discuss the aspects outside of football that he thinks a young athlete should try and master as they work toward an NFL career. When we get to the third quarter, we're going to be discussing his top three pieces of advice for the strength and conditioning coach that wants to work at the NFL level. Thomas is also going to explain the difference between working at the collegiate level as a strength and conditioning coach and the NFL level. When we get into the fourth quarter, we're going to discuss how he approaches leadership as a strength and conditioning coach at the NFL level. I'm telling y'all, this is a tremendous episode. Please feel free to share, download, subscribe to the Sports Mastery Podcast on iTunes. I'm looking forward to your ratings and review. Welcome to the show. Thomas said we're trying to do too much, but he's just new to this, so he, he, he'll he catch on. <laughs> yeah, man, we're making it happen. Oh, no, this is big time now. I mean, this, this, is, this is bigger than Skype right here. <laughs> yeah, I, I like Zoom. It's, it's been a little easier for me. You know yeah. what I mean? I was using another platform, and we were on uh, – it was all, all uh, audio, but now we can actually see each other, and it records a video and an audio file. Good deal. You know, uh, so Sean, he he was telling me that you're. Are you the head strength coach, or are you the assistant strength coach with the uh, New York Giants? I'm an assistant with the Giants. Yeah, tell tell us about uh, you know your your path to getting to the Giants. How did that start? Um. Well, I think it, I've got to start back when I first went to college. So I played football at the University of Tennessee uh, from 1997 to 2001, and while there. You know, I, I actually went to college as an engineer major. You know, I had an uncle who was a civil engineer that went to Vanderbilt, another uncle that was an architectural engineer that went to Hampton. And, you know, seeing what they did and enjoying designing things, you know, it sparked my interest. But what you learn real quick is that being engineering majors, architecture majors, and trying to play Division One football is extremely tough. Like, you, you there's a fine line to balance the academic and athletic demands at a Division I school. And so when I switched from major, I went into sports management, and actually my next goal was to try to be a sports agent. So as I'm going through uh, finishing undergrad and getting ready for, you know, I say law school because I wanted to go to law school. I've got a sister that's a judge now, but she was a lawyer. You know, I applied to UT Law School, and, you know, at that time, they were like, well, your grades aren't good, but if you work to get your master's, then, you know, that'll help your chances trying to get into law school. So I was like, okay, I can do that. So then I went to grad school at the state of UT to get in grad school, and while I was there, you know, you just kind of, you know, just played around with with strength conditioning um, because at the end of the day, you're still, you know, I was still an athlete. I still loved the game, wanted to be around the game one way or another. And also just the love of being able to work out. So, you know, that it, it worked out there. I finished my master's. I obviously did not pursue my law degree. But from there, my first job was at South Carolina State and HBCU in Orangeburg, South Carolina. Um, you know, they were looking to try and really grow their strength conditioning um, program because the head coach there at the time, Buddy Pugh, had just come from South Carolina with Lou Holtz. And so he had seen what it was like to be at a big-time university, but it meant to really have a organized strength conditioning program and how important it was for you, for the culture of the team. So while, while I was, you know, I was there, and originally I interviewed, I was supposed to be hired for football, but before you know it, you know, the word gets around through the athletic department. Now you've got volleyball and men's and women's tennis and men's and women's bat, you know, got other sports that want to, you know, they want you to take care of the athletes as well. And, you know, at that time I was 24 years old, like, you know, no problem. I'll take it on. Let's, you know, it'll be a good challenge, but it'll be a great experience. You know, I want these athletes to be able to enjoy their college careers the same way I did. So, you know, from South Carolina State, went to Grambling State, Grambling State to Mississippi State, Mississippi State to 
North Carolina State, North Carolina State to Texas Tech, Texas Tech to Fresno State. That's where I got my first opportunity to be a Division One or FBS head strength coach. Um, from there, went to West Kentucky as a head guy, and then from from there to here as an assistant. Yeah, that's incredible, man. Do Do you still have people at Fresno State? Um, I know some of the players, you know, they're still there, but, you know, no coaches. You know, when Jeff Tepper got there, he cleaned house. You know, you know the nature of the business. People want their own people, and I can yeah. respect that. Yeah, the reason why I was asking, I had a gentleman here. His name is Alex Jones, and uh, he graduated from Western Oregon University and found me online and did an internship with me here for a whole year. And then he was able to go down to Stanford and do uh, an official collegiate internship. And from there, he went to uh, Fresno State, and he's almost done with his master's. So okay. I'm looking forward to once he gets uh, his CSCS, real good brother from North Portland, to introduce him to, uh, to both of y'all. You know, yeah. so he's in the trenches at, at Fresno State. Oh, well, yeah. And, and so I do know the guy who replaced me. Um, you know, he's a real good guy. He, came, he actually came from Stanford. So that was their connection. But, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm always – I'm at the point now, I just turned 40, that it's time to start pouring and helping younger brothers because the profession is dying for us. You know, it, un, it's unfortunate that we're to, typically looked at for the diversity hire or the minority hire. But, you know, we're, they're good young strength coaches that are capable of being head guys and being pro, leaders of programs. You know, it's interesting that you say that because my path was different where I majored in speech communications and I, I didn't have a guide that say, hey, you need to go get a master's in exercise science. I think you would be good at this. But when I get interns, I'm like, for y'all to play at the highest level, I need y'all to get a master's. And then yep. it's going to open up a bunch of doors. So anytime I get an internship and I was just speaking to uh, to the young exercise science students at Portland Community College earlier this week, I'm like, you guys have to get a master's. It's imperative. Yep. You know, anything you want to do, it's going to open a ton of doors. So I appreciate you saying that. You said something key earlier when you were at the HBCUs and the work that you were doing on the importance of having a strength and conditioning program for the culture of a particular sport. And we could just say this for football. What would you say to the high school coaches who probably don't take their strength and conditioning serious? How could you enlighten them on this subject matter? Um, that's a very good question. The first thing I would say is that by not stressing or supporting your strength conditioning program, you're doing your athletes a disservice. Yep. Because so much of what strength conditioning is really is more mental than physical. As strength coaches, you're, you're not only just teaching guys how to lift weights and move weight and, you know, do stuff like that, but you're taking them to a, new, a different place mentally and pushing themselves and exposing, exposing themselves to a stress that they've never experienced. And so it's the first time that they do something that they've never done. You know, it's like that first time you succeed, okay, now you want a little bit more. Well, now I want to see what else I can do. Now I want to see what else I can do. And now when you get that level of confidence, you play with that. You carry yourself with that. You know, you just act a lot differently instead of being the, the you know, a questionable or I don't know, or, you know, just lacking confidence. Yeah, you know, uh, I agree with you. I remember uh, listening to some of the NSCA uh, symposiums back in, two, back in 2012, and uh, there was somebody in one of the audiences and, and the gentleman asked, well, where does mental preparation fit in? And I forget who was speaking at the time. And the guy was just, he just said, physical preparation, physical preparation, physical preparation. And you can see it at a young level like high school when, when they've been working out for a year, two, three versus their competitors, how much more confidence that they might have on the field diamond quarter track. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and especially in a game like football because – you know, one of the one of the learning experiences for me was from my transition from being in the SEC to now being in the MEAC, you're dealing with some athletes who, you know, truthfully, their high schools don't have it. But you hear the stories of, you know, the athletes that they have on the field, but then when they run into bigger and better programs that physically they just can't stand up to them. And mm -hmm. so while – you know, while they, while athletically they could match up with them, 
it's the point in time that your body just going to start to break down. And that's when those better teams, those, you know, more physically astute teams will really want to put, that's when they show their killer instinct. Like we know we've got these guys, let's put them to bed. And so, you know, they play and they carry themselves with a different edge because of that. That's right. You know, uh, Sean, what, what do you think about what uh, Coach Stallworth is expressing right now? Oh, he's absolutely, he's absolutely right. I mean, you know, uh, obviously he has a lot of experience, but, you know, not only is it physical, it, it's, uh, it is mental. I mean, when you, when you, you get a, a kid who has like no experience in a weight room, and you're putting these stresses on their body, you know, how do they respond? You know, you're looking at how they respond to it. You know, some guys, they don't like, they don't like to feel uncomfortable. And, and it's okay in the weight room if you're starting to feel that way uh, because that's going to transfer onto the field. And because you know, once, you know, you're, if, if you're uncomfortable in the weight room and then you adjust to it and you get on the field, you know, you can, uh, you, you'll be uncomfortable in some certain certain circumstances and you'll adjust to it so um it's all there you know and, and like you said a lot of programs don't have it i i've run into coaches here and you know they talk about their program or oh, our kids are fine we have this but then when you go in the field and you look and see how they move and it's like man you're doing these kids a disservice you know you want them to be more powerful or quicker but you don't have a program that fosters that that encourages that and that gives them that the leg up. Yeah, you're right. And, and I think it's interesting being a strength coach or a sports performance coach. And especially, you know, all of us, we play the game. You know, I played at Portland State, Western Oregon, later some semi-pro football and a few indoor uh, football teams, arena too. So we know what it looks like. We know, we understand the skullduggery of having to go to the gym and work out on, even on those days that you don't even want to be there. So there's like a psychology that... Like, to that that we've been through from a subjective experience that we can relay. Could you touch on, touch on that, uh, Thomas, as far as understanding like the psychology of like, I got to go to the weight room three, four, sometimes five, six days a week. And even when you don't want to be there, but you still got to go to get the hip mobility. You still got to go to get your core work in. You know, it's funny you say that because one of the things that, you know, you talk about the importance of training. Um, I was at the Combine in Indy last week, and I was talking to my mentor, Harold Nash, who is a head strength coach with the Detroit Lions. And, you know, when you ask players what's your level of importance, what's their level of, you know, of training, how important is it, you know, the answers you can get, but then it's like, okay, well, when you hear the answer, okay, now walk me through it. So walk me through your day. So it's like, okay, they love it, but then it's at the end of the day. But if it's really something that you love, it's usually a priority. So for me, and you know, this, of course, it's not about me, but I'm looking for the guy who it's first thing in the morning because now you know you've got it taken care of. But as we know, if you procrastinate and put stuff off the day, throughout the day, it's easy to, now at the end of the day, you just don't have it in you. Or something comes up and now you've lost the day. And so now it becomes, oh, I got to get it in tomorrow. Whereas if you just go ahead and get it in at the beginning of the day, you know it's taken care of. And there is a and it's a different feeling about your day after you get that first lift in to get your body up and going. You know what, I agree with you 100% on that because I feel a lot better when I get my personal workouts in in the morning. You know what I mean? But late in the day, it's kind of hard and I have procrastinated. You know, uh, when, I, when I'm feeling right and when I just muscle through it, I still will go. So I, I think what you're saying from getting it in early first thing in the morning, there's some truth to that. Now, what I wanted to ask you, man, was what aspects outside of football do you think a young athlete should try and master as they work toward an NFL career if that's their goal and they're already at a Division One level or they're looking at getting scholarships or offers already at the D1 level? You know, it's funny when you talk about mastering something, it's the relationship part. And what I mean by that is surrounding yourself with the right people. Because one of the things that, you know, we heard when I was in college and as and now going through, you know, the, as a player and even as a coach, there are plenty of talented people in the world. The best, there are more, ath more athletic and more talented people in the world, but 
they did they weren't surrounded by the right people to keep them in the right direction. Mm-hmm. Whereas now in high school, if you are really serious about it, you need to find that other person that's serious about it because now that person is going, you know, the old Bible verse, iron sharpens iron, that person is going to hold you accountable. You can hold them accountable. And now you all can reap the benefits together. But if you're trying to do it, you know, if you're just trying to master this thing, thinking that, okay, you got it on your own or, you know, you've seen somebody else do it. It's one thing when you see somebody else do it, but it's a different thing when you have to go through it with somebody. That's right. Sean, can you add on to this? Uh, well, nobody, nobody gets there uh, by themselves. And, and Star was right. You know, you definitely uh, have to surround yourself with, with people who are going in that same direction. I mean, how many, I mean, we all know stories of, of guys who, who were, uh, who were superior athletes, but they surround themselves with the wrong people and they fell by the wayside. And, you know, some guys who were not that, that guy, but, you know, they got a break here and there. They surround themselves with good people and they got the break. So, and especially in this, this day and age, you know, with some of the, the, the youngsters now uh, and with the social media and everything, you really have to uh, be aware of who you sound around yourself with. You know, you, that direction you want to go in, that's who you get some people that that's going to help you get there, you know, and not only them help you, you help them and you guys go together. Um, like, like uh, Thomas said, that, that, that iron sharpened iron is, is real. And, you know, by surrounding yourself with people who, who are not uh, going to help you become better, um, they're just shortchanging themselves and, you, you, and you're not challenging yourselves. And at the same time, you don't want to surround yourself with yes, man. You want people that's going to be real with you. That's going to give you the, the, uh, the, the, the honest truth uh, that's going to challenge you. That's going to let you know when you're coming up short and that you can do better. You know, don't look at it as, as them hating on you or criticizing. Look at them that they want to get you better. So, um, you, know, you know, some of these, you know, some of the kids, you just got to, you know, not be soft. You know, just just handle your business, but definitely surrounding yourself, you know, with your with the right peers and also with the right mentors. And that's very important because they some of them been to where you're trying to go. So and and by their, their input, uh, that can help you uh, miss a few uh, uh, potholes. Yeah, I think what you said is key is the social side. And, and we've talked about this at length before as far as having emotional intelligence and having social intelligence in order to make the right moves, because what you can do socially can affect, you know, uh, what you do psychologically in terms of you do you have some type of antic outside of sport, outside of school, you get in trouble. Now you don't miss the game or two. You got to come back. Now uh, you're working on, on the physical side because you haven't been able to practice. And now there's a psychological side because you're not confident, you know, or, or 100 percent certain as had you not had the, uh, the mishap or, or whatever it is you did socially, whether you were suspended, um, had detention, couldn't make practice or whatever punishment that came of that. We, we've seen it happen with kids over and over again that had they just hung with the right crowd, they would have put themselves in a key position or stayed where they were. You know, so I, I agree with you 100 percent. You know, as we get into the fourth quarter, Thomas, I, I wanted to ask you, what are your top three pieces of advice for the strength coach wanting to work at the NFL level? Mm, top three advice, pieces of advice. The first piece, you know, it's again, it's go to the relationship. It's building a network, you know, because the NFL is a different monster in itself because it's a, a close knit fraternity. You know, and it's not that it's a bad thing, but there are things that happen on this level that happen so fast that it's easy for you. It's easy for the outsider to never know what is going on. Mm -hmm. Things happen that quick. And in the process of it happening, if you're not in the right person's circle, if the right person doesn't know about you, then you just miss opportunities. You know, these jobs come and go really. I mean, you, you think there were seven, eight head coaches that, that were turned over this this season. That's, you know, how 20 other coaches, whatever number of people that were on those staffs, but as these head coaches are interviewing for these positions, 
they're looking for people in the right circles or in their circle that can connect them. Um, so that would be the first thing, you know, networking. The second thing is just being patient. You know, I, I was at Western Kentucky, and funny thing is the guy who recommended me for the job in Western Kentucky is the person I'm working for now. You know, I he had recommended me. I interviewed. I got the job. And I was in a great situation. Loved the head coach I was working for. My family was happy there. And he gives me a call out of the blue. And, you know, it's like I wasn't looking. The NFL was never on my radar. I tell people that all the time. I was never chasing the NFL. I, I literally love being in college. But it is still the NFL. And you, ha- as a true football fan, you just want to par- want that opportunity to say that you've done it. And so, you know, you have to be patient with those opportunities because it's not that you can go chase these jobs. NFL jobs, especially as strength coaches and head strength coaches, are harder to come by than people realize because there are so many different dynamics to the, to the head position. It's not like a true college program where the head coach, where the strength coach is tied to the head coach. There can be organizational hires. There can be athletic trainer hires. There's different dynamics to navigate. So, you know, it, it's hard to figure out how or when you'll get that opportunity. So, you know, that's patience. But then lastly is just, and I, I want to make sure I say it the right way, but a genuineness to work with athletes because it's easy to now get on this level. And, you know, we've got a great team here. I can walk in, I can walk in work seeing Eli Manning. I get to work with Odell Beckham you know, a Saquon, bar, like the people that you work with, but you can't be starstruck. You have to understand this is their livelihood. So they are there to get their bodies taken care of. They still want to be coached. You know, Eli is 37 years old and still comes to the gym looking to get better. If you can coach him on how to set his scap, how to set his core, how to transfer a weight, he wants to listen to all of that because the, these guys – want to be the best at what they can do for as long as they can do it. So, you know, you have to be genuine with these guys and not be fans, but still be a coach to them. I understand. <clears throat> what, 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 what would you say from your experience is the major difference between collegiate strength and conditioning and the NFL? Going back to that genuine part, like you know, if, if you lack any, and I say any confidence, or any bit of knowledge, these guys see through it. And once they see through it, you're done. Because, you know, these guys have their own circles of, and I say circles, but, you know, they might train here one day, train here another week. You know, because the NFL offseason is so long, you know, like we didn't make the playoffs. So our guys have been off from basically January 1 until we see them again April 15th. These guys are traveling. They're all over the place. They don't just sit still in the offseason. And so if, you, if you're saying something different from what one of the other trainers said, that's fine. But you better be able to explain it and articulate it so that they understand exactly why you're doing it and what you mean by it. Because if you stuttering or hemming and hawing, yeah, that, oh, he don't know what he's talking about. Mm-hmm. And you'll lose him that quick. How, how do you approach leadership as a strength and conditioning coach at the NFL level? And this is something Sean and I talked about, and we, we spoke about it at length, so we was looking forward to hearing you talk about this. You know, it, it's – again, I, it's, this is funny because I'm honored to be a part of this, but, you know, it's like stuff you just don't really think of when you're in a position. But for me, I, I'm a big relationship person. You know, I'm working on my doc, and Sean knows, but I'm working on my doctor in sports psychology because I think at the root of everything is the connection. And so when you talk about leadership on this level, you're dealing with grown men that, that are making light years more money than you are. So you can't try to just hold the title over their head. Like, you know, they don't have to call you coach. They can call you Star Wars, Thomas. It's, what, it's not about a title with them but they have to genuinely know that you are a man of your word and that you have their best interest in mind. And so as you have respect and humility for them and towards them, they return that to you. But if you think this ain't college where it's a dictator, oh, I'm going to just talk to you any kind of way. I'm going to raise my, no, these are grown men that you're dealing with. And so just like you interact with any other grown man, regardless of it being football and it being this, 
high testosterone, high aggressive, you know, sport, you still have to have some humility amongst you, um, you know, with yourself as you're dealing with these guys. You know, um, without naming any names, do you have any particular stories where, you know, things might have went awry with a particular strength coach and a team uh, based on what you're talking about as far as leadership? You know, <laughs> not, I, you know, like you said, can't say any names, but, you know, there was a – and, you know, this is the other funny thing about the NFL because of free agency and player moves. You can talk to these players that come from different places and they can tell you about good strength coaches and bad strength coaches. I mean, and so it's still a learning process for us because if you want to stick around this league, this is a player's league. If they, if you are a joke or you're a shuck and they don't believe in you, please believe they're going to talk about it to some other teammates or at other friends on other teams, and it don't take long for word to travel. But to that point, there was a situation where, you know, Young, young strength coach. He tries to come into a team, and it's the off season. And he's trying to raise his voice at a guy, <laughs> you know. And the guy went at him, and it got physical. I mean, and and that's why I say you have to realize that you're dealing with grown men. And so, like I used to tell my college athletes, don't think that because we're in this setting, a controlled setting with rules and regulations, that one, I'm just going to talk to you anyway but two, that you're going to be protected and think that you're going to talk to me anyway because there are things that you might try and hear that you know good and well if you walk across that street or walk across that campus and try it, you might get lumped up, you might get locked up, but there are going to be consequences, and I'm the same way. And so I believe that it goes both ways. I'm not going to try to disrespect you because I know I wouldn't do that on the street, and so because we're at work, I still want to be a professional with you. That's right. So the key to all this is being a professional. Sean, uh, what else would you like to add in terms of leadership? You know, I know you've had extensive conversations with Coach Stallworth. Uh, well, leadership, he, well, he, he pretty much said it. I mean, it's all relation, relationship. Uh, and I think with that relationship, uh, when, you, when, you, when you develop that and it's genuine and the guy knows that you have a guy or girl know you have their interest at, their best interest at heart, um, the respect goes there. And then they're more uh, apt to follow you. They're not going to follow you because they have to. They're going to do it because they respect you. You know, they're going to know that, you know, you're a person of your word, uh, that you're going to give it to them straight. And, and then that, that goes a long ways. It really does. So it is our relationship. I mean, any, any relationship, relationships, uh, you know, obviously are relational, but leadership is relationship. It's bit, is you know is, is saying hi to the person that makes the least money to the person that makes the highest money and 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 it's just it's just simple as that and unfortunately a lot of people don't get it uh but i, I you know i do want to i do want to tell this, this story and 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 star Wars, i don't even think he knows about it but when he was at uh and i think i hadn't met uh uh thomas uh but uh i do want to say when he was talking about the college fraternity but we do have another connection. We are fraternity brothers of the greatest fraternity in the world, Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity mm -hmm. Incorporated. So mm -hmm. we are fraternity brothers. Uh, but he was at uh, Fresno, and I knew a young man there. And this young man was telling me a story about the strength coach that was tripping. Now he's tripping, man. He made me do this and came at me like this. I mean, he was just on one, right? So I'm sitting there listening to him. I'm like, okay, all right. You know, and in my head, you know, I, I know there's always two sides of the story. But make a long story short, then I run into Thomas. I get to know this brother. And then, we, you know, we're hanging out. And, and over the years, I see more and more, you know, of how he is. And then I'm reflecting back on this young man. And so when the new coach came in, the young man kind of like fell off, you know, and it got worse and worse and worse. But then, I'm watching Thomas's career, and it's soaring and soaring and soaring. And now you look at – honestly, if you look at the, the, the directions of, of both of them, they went opposite directions. And, what, and all I'm saying is to uh, go back on what we talked about, surrounding yourself <laughs> with the right people. Now, if it had, now I, I, I'll say if, if maybe this young man got, got, you know, 
got out of his feelings and really understood what was going on, who's to say he might have benefited from that, even though, was, you know, Star Wars moved on. Maybe there was something that he could have spoken to his life that, that might have helped this young man. But it was interesting that he was saying all this stuff and it just did not, it didn't make sense. And really, to this day, it doesn't make sense. Now, when I see him, I'm like, I know you were tripping. I mm-hmm. definitely know you were tripping. And, 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 and it's unfortunate. And it really is unfortunate that he could not uh, tap into what uh, uh, Coach Star Wars had to offer. So uh, that's, that's my son's story there. Wow. You know, uh, Coach Stallworth, I wanted to ask you, what position did you play? Played linebacker. Um, uh, linebacker. Let me say linebacker, and then for one spring, numbers were down, so I had to play fullback. But, yeah, I was a linebacker all, you know, throughout my entire career. Okay. You know, uh, what's your personal thoughts on uh, seven-on-seven football in high school? <laughs> it's, ba- it's the same thing of AAU basketball. Yep. It's a lot of bad habits to make people feel good and to make some adults a lot of money. Okay. You know, there's, there's nothing good that comes out of the seven on seven scene because one, you're putting players in unrealistic expectations. Well, yeah, they're in out and they're outside, they're playing the game, but there's zero pressure to have of Lyman coming after you or the thrill, and I say the thrill because as a defense player, I'm thinking about chasing pl- quarterbacks and blitzing and stuff like that, but right. there, there's not that level of threat or that pressure that you have to perform under. You know, you can sit back there, pat the ball, you can look good as you want to back there and hadn't taken a hit a whole, t- a whole game. When you hit somebody, life changes. You get to <laughs> rattle somebody, life changes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't I you mean, say when you, as, yeah. as ball players, both of you all know that you can even at, on my side as a line, as a defensive guy. When you get run over, you like, oh, this, he got something to him. Let me, I need okay. Let me tighten this chin strap up. Give my, give me a new mouthpiece. It's gonna be a different game. And so you know, you realize that the physicality of the game that's missing makes that you know the seven on seven element, uh, you know, a lot more fluffy and less fundamentally sound as, than it needs to be. You know, okay. one thing I always wondered, though, you know, and this is another aspect uh, that I think I've tapped in. They kind of leave, leave the linemen out. They're, they're nobody. Yeah. No, well, I'm looking specifically <laughs> at the Pop Warner level. So okay. they're talking about 707s and all this stuff, but nobody's really doing anything with the linemen. There's no 7 and 7, 707 for linemen, right? You see a few, like, uh, what they call trench camps. And, and I, you know, I, I coach a seven-on-seven seven team, and what I tell my kids, you know, this isn't serious. All you guys are out here to do is really work on your craft as a defensive back and as a receiver. You're not going to get a scholarship out of this. If you look bad out here, you're definitely going to look bad in pads. But I'm trying to help kids tighten up their routes you know, read defenses and then, uh, you know, work on their footwork. But I, I, I think that you're, you're a hundred percent right. When you look at certain organizations, you know, um, man, speak on it some more, you know, you know what, what else would you, what, what else would you say and feel and feel, uh, free to speak freely about how you feel about it? Because this is all good information. Oh, you saying well, name I mean, names? <laughs> no, 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 just like how you feel about seven on seven <laughs> culture. You know, like you know, Sean, we've talked about AAU basketball. Yes. you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. I mean because what you literally what you're doing is you're you're it's basketball on grass, and so you're getting guys to you know, and and I hear what you're saying as a coach. You want them to work on their routes, but we know that they can get out there, and as a wide receiver, you might not. You know, because 707, they try to eliminate the contact. Now you don't have to worry about trying to beat a press. You don't have to work on that release. You can just take off. And now this DB that normally might try to grab you by the hip or tug on your jersey, you don't have to deal with that. So you're not able to develop uh, an essential part of the game, which is to learn how to battle and work on your releases and stem routes and do all those. You know, wide receivers know how to use a chicken wing to create separation. Mm -hmm. You can't do that because. What you don't want to have happen at 707 is, yeah, you don't want contact. You don't want guys to get hurt. But, you know, there's the level of competition that it happens. And before you know it, it, you know, it just goes awry. But, yeah, I'm not really a fan of it because 
The other thing is, like you said, you try to tell, and I and I know that you have your head on straight. You're going to tell your players the right thing. You'll have some coaches that come out here and they're coaching like it's Super Bowl Fifty Two, baby. <laughs> I've worked at colleges. No, seriously, like I've worked at colleges and during the summer as strength coach, you have to help officiate or whatever. There have been coaches that have literally taken their teams and left because they did not like a call. They didn't like something. And I'm like, okay, you're an adult. That's right. You're showing your kids, you're showing this team that it's okay to just leave because, because you don't like something. Really? And then we wonder why our society is the way it is. And so now – you know, of course, we know these these coaches that are coaching these teams are dealing with a different demographic of kids. So this is the one male that they get a chance to see, and and they think this this is the right way. No, baby, that ain't, that ain't it. And we wonder again, we wonder why society is the way it is. Because if we don't like something, we can just quit, or we can just leave, or we can just go somewhere else. Instead of guess what? That's life. You suck it up, you deal with it. We play again. There's no such right. thing as an undefeated college football team. No such thing as undefeated NFL team. In most in most states, high school teams don't even go undefeated. So yes, you gonna, you might lose a game in a seven on heaven forbid it's a seven on seven tournament. You, <laughs> lost that. you ain't put a pad on. You ain't put a helmet on. Your record is still zero and zero. But yeah. you had a chance for a great opportunity to compete against some other people that are probably just as good as you are. But because you were in your feelings, you didn't like X, Y, and Z, you just ready to quit and leave. No, I, I like it's, I, I, you know, it's, it's it's comical to me. It really it is. It all goes back to leadership. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, uh, some of the antics that we see out here, as far as like people, they might have a family member that that uh, that coaches in the NFL, or they might have connections to a few college coaches. So they'll they'll be coaching seven on seven teams and basically selling kids to play for them. On the, on the chance that they'll get a scholarship or, or increase their ranking with 247 Sports and some of these other entities, you know, which, you know, some of us find it really laughable. Yeah, oh, without a doubt. I mean, you know, it, and again, that's, that's why I call it the AU version, you know, the football version of AU because, you know, everybody knows the, the, the corrupt nature of AAU basketball. You know, you're talking about, and not to jump subjects, but just to illustrate how corrupt basketball is, you got a coach at LSU now that has that just got in trouble. Well, hey, 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 hey! I know, I know that. I'm, just, I'm not. <laughs> hey, hey, you, hey, you left, uh, you left Arizona out. You left uh, Kansas out. <laughs> that just happened today. I'm just saying about today. <laughs> Friday, March eighth. I'm just going about today. Yeah. But everybody yeah. knows the same thing is happening seven on seven, and you, you know, you get some of these people that stack these teams and like. You're trying to stack a seven on seventeen, really? Yeah. I mean these ki- these kids are not going to be playing together. If anything, they're going to be playing against each other once the high school season starts. But yet, you got the best player from this area, the best to make yourself as a coach look good and to get your team recognition. But then when they go back to their team and they're the best player and they don't have just as good talent on the team, now when they're struggling. And they're looking just normal, looking average. Oh, well, what happened? Where's the leadership? How do you take over a game? And then how do you help your teammates rise to the occasion? Go ahead, Sean. Yeah, so I got a question. You know, we were talking about the professional level, and you know, and we're talking about uh, AAU, um, 707 AAU. So now at the professional level, and, and, and then we were talking about specialization. And I don't know if you if you if you heard him talking. How many of those guys, you know, specialized in football? Or do, or do you hear stories of, of a guy? May, he may have been all state in basketball, baseball, you know, other sports, or they didn't play start playing football till later. Have you heard any of those stories? Because you know, everybody now, if I start my kid at eight years old, he's going to be uh, a professional this or that. And we we've had those conversations here um, uh, about specialization in sports uh, at length too. It, it, Sean, it's it's again. I'm loving this conversation because you're you all are bringing like back so many memories and just like bringing just stories out. 
that generation of multi-sport athletes is gone because that's right. Sport specialization is starting so much younger now. So, and it's not just sports specialization, but it's the fear of injury. And so when I was at Tennessee, one of my, you know, like our class of 97, I would probably go on record as saying it was one of the best college football recruiting class of all time because you're talking about a Jamal Lewis who rushed for 2,000 yards, a Travis Henry who rushes for 2,000 yards, a Travis Stevens who in the swamp against Steve Spurrier goes for 250, um, a David Martin, Cozy Coleman, Fred Weir, just a bunch of great – Dominique Stevenson, I can name all 25 of us but that are still good friends. But all that being said, a David Martin, a Deion Grant, guys that were also McDonald's High School All-Americans in basketball were five-star athletes, five-star football players. There was no fear of them getting hurt. They just wanted to play ball. It didn't matter what kind of ball. They wanted to play ball, and they were going to play ball all the time. Whereas now, either you're a basketball player, you're a baseball player, you're a football player. I mean, you look at the situation with Kyle Murray. He could, they weren't going to let him do both. When I was at NC State, that was the big thing about Russell Wilson. You know, the stories about him and Tom O'Brien going back and forth because Russell wanted to play baseball, but he wanted, but O'Brien wanted him at football. You know, the, it, it's just not there anymore. And it's because, one, coaches demand so much out of them, but, two, the fear of injury. Mm. You know, that's, that's uh, ironic, too, because now the fear of injury – is worse when you specialize. <laughs> oh, it, it is. I mean, as, as strength coaches, we understand that over overuse injuries are on the rise because people are getting exposed to something at such a young age, their body is doing the same thing for so long and never learning any other athletic movement patterns or any just any other spatial awareness skills or anything. So now it's okay, well, all I'm doing is throwing my right arm. I'm always rotating this yeah. way. Well, you're going to have a right arm show injury. You're going to have a, a left oblique strain. You're going to have that right oblique strain because you're doing the same thing. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it's, it is comical. But, mm -hmm. again, you know, you can't tell coaches anything. Coaches yeah. have the answer. And so, you know, you just have to defer to them. Yeah, no, and, that's I, I, and that's coupled with, with uh, not getting any rest and the mm -hmm. fact that they are quick to pay money to AAUs, but nobody wants to pay to have a strength coach work with your child, <laughs> which is yeah. very comical. You know, the other the other side that I've seen of it is like, especially with AAU athletes, uh, the select soccer kids, and it, I'm sure it's going to uh, come down the line with uh, seven on seven, <clears throat> is the uh, the pressure to play on the select team, the pressure to play on the all-star team to go travel. So it doesn't allow time for training. And then they're getting talked out of training where it's almost not important. You know, I mean, speaking of the subject, I just had a lady contact me yesterday and she wants, she's been seeing, you know, what I've been doing online as far as the promotion and the marketing. She's like, I like what you're doing. I want to get my son over to you. He's just finishing up basketball. He played football. He's going to run track. And then uh, in the middle of track season, you know, he's going to start AAU basketball. So I'm like, listen, Miss Jones, when he has time for you to get him in here at a minimum of twice a week for about six to eight weeks so we can see some gains, I would say contact me, me then. I was just really upfront with her. But you could see how, you know, you almost get swindled as the string part is the last part. Yeah, I mean, and it's <laughs> so much of the the focus on skill development. They completely forget and neglect the important the importance of physical development. You know, you're, you're talking about situations where now in high school, some of these strength some of the the strength coaches are just football or sport coaches that are taking X program, Y program from their college or from somewhere else and not knowing the rationale behind why, it, you know, the program is laid out the way it is or learning how to teach the exercise the correct way. They just expected the, the time that they're in school that their training is enough. 
But as we know, training has to be intentional and it has to be supervised to really maximize whatever that exercise is. Exactly. That's high power, man. I think we're going to close out right there. Sean, did you did you have any more questions to uh, ask Thomas? No, I just want to say I uh, appreciate you for uh, yes, taking sir. the time out uh, and uh, and speaking uh, to the subject and adding some things that, you know, we hadn't thought about. Uh, you know, uh, as you mentioned, you know, you know, NFL was not your your goal. But, you know, for some people, it is a lot, it's, it's their goal. And, and listening to you and and what you had to offer today was very valuable. So I just want to take my t- uh, take the time to say thank you for uh, sharing that with us. Yeah, I appreciate you, man. Yeah, I remember them backs from Tennessee because I played running back. I remember them dudes vividly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, you know, we had, and and I I know we we I, this is like an awesome forum that you all are doing. So I'm honored to be a part of this. Again, I, I salute both of you all for really taking this stance and doing this to give coaches like myself a chance to help someone because at the end of the day, as coaches, that's all we want. If you're exactly. in it for the right reason, let me say that. That's right. All you want to do is help someone else because someone helped you. And I, I think you said a key thing about life in general, and it doesn't matter what industry you're in. If you're working to be the best that you can be and realize that it's a marathon, it's not a short sprint, opportunities are going to come to you as long as you stay diligent and persevere, man. That's what I hear about your story. And that's been one of my biggest takeaways. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's, and it's not a, a cheesy plug for our fraternity, but one of our cardinal principles is perseverance because. Yeah, life is a, like you said, life is a marathon. And, you know, in in this generation of get it now, get it quick, it's got to happen for me, that ain't real life. You know, you didn't get this platform. You weren't able to create this platform right away. I know that you've been sharp and been smart your entire life, but it took time for you to have to mold it, model it, check all the boxes to make sure that it's done the right way so that when you got the one opportunity, You could do it to the best of your ability instead of, okay, let me just throw this together. And then if that potentially fails, you don't get that second one. Yeah. Yeah, you're right about that. It's just been one show at a time, man, and we're getting close to three years. Man, that's that's awesome. I I mean, again, I congratulate you. I salute you all for this because, you know, it's this. there's a lot of substance (coughs) to what you all are doing. There is no ego. There's no self-promotion. But you all are looking to help people. And so – that's why I say when you're in coaching for the right reason, good things happen and people can appreciate that. 